Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960 AM. Uh, Podcasting has taken off. I actually broadcast all my shows as podcasts as well. And uh, Amanda Caputo has written a book on podcasting. Amanda, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's actually the second edition, I understand. It's coming out in November. That's right, November 14, but people could pre-order now if they'd like. It's called Let's Talk Podcasting, The Essential Guide to Doing It Right. And you can go to letstalkpodcasting.com for all the details. So give me some, give us some of the details. How do you do podcasting right? Now, actually, let's start with why did you write this book? And then we'll come back to the, the suggestions and how we do it right. All right. So podcasting has been a love of mine for a long time. And what I like to say is what's happening now is an audio nerd's dream come true, which is that it's popular for the masses. Um, and year over year, we are seeing listenership grow and grow. So a common myth that I like to debunk is that podcasting is a bubble. There's too many podcasts out there. I've already missed the boat. It's just simply not true. We look at YouTube and how many videos are out there and how that continues to grow. And as a medium, um, it's still just gearing up. We are seeing, if you look at the research, the people who listen to the most amount of podcasts every single day, they're called super listeners. Year over year, they're listening for longer and longer every single day. We haven't actually capped out, like maxed out at what is the most amount that people will listen to. So I find that fascinating. Um, and we know that a lot of the numbers that are out there, and this is actually in the book, when you try to figure out how many podcasts exist, well, there's no way of actually knowing that simply because podcasts live in all different places. When you say podcast, are you counting video podcasts? Then what's the total amount of video podcasts on YouTube? No one actually knows that number. Some are on both Apple and Spotify. So if you look at Apple's numbers and Spotify's numbers, you can't simply add them together to get a total number of podcasts. So um, there's a lot of complexity to that. And also that a lot of podcasts are inactive. So do you count those? You see what I mean? So um, yes, there's probably millions of podcasts out there, but there is still space for people to make them. And I just love empowering people to get in on the medium. You asked, why did I write it? I just want people to feel empowered, to give it a shot. I think raising different people's voices is really important. This is the most accessible way of broadcasting yourself. I think that's really exciting. So podcasts are up. Um, you see uh, streaming up, cables down, regular media, regular newspaper media is down. Uh, I'm on AM radio. Am I so like out of it and, uh, and, and old time, it's unbelievable? No, I think there's going to always be a place for talk radio specifically. And of course, I have a heart for talk radio because that's where my career began. Um, and most recently, I was a program director at a radio station. So I love talk radio. Um, I think there's... The biggest difference is that podcasts are on demand, right? You can listen when you want, how you want, where you want. And there's, and that's why streaming is up too. There is something that draws people towards consuming content that way. But with talk radio, I think there is something magical about the timeliness of it. If there was ever even an emergency, you could go to radio to figure out the latest news and what is happening and what we need to do. And I think that there, there's actually a public service element to it that will keep it alive forever, right? This is the best way to get a large um, a large bulletin or information out to like a large audience. So I think that's incredible. I also think there is something nice about the, the two-way back and forth of radio, right? Podcasts, you can't like call in live and have a conversation with someone who was just listening to you being broadcast a moment ago. And so when I talk about radio, it's like, like let's lean into those things that differentiate it from podcasts. Um, and then let's look at how audio is evolving and learn from each other and take best practices. I think sometimes that's where the gap lies. But anyway, so I think I, I love radio. I think radio will be around. But I do think that uh, podcasts can serve in different ways. And, you know, one of the perks on that side is you're not really flipping between stations like you are with radio. You hit a you hit a commercial, people hit their next preset. Whereas a podcast, you're usually committing to an episode. You're not flipping once it takes a quick break or at all. So um, that's really nice about building that retention and time spent listening to a radio station. You'd be lucky if it was around 10 minutes. Um, but time spent listening to podcasts, it's a lot longer. 
So the thing I like about my show and about podcasts is uh, the long form interview versus, you know, on, on regular TV or regular cable or, or, or even a lot of talk radio, the interviews are very short, um, you know, less than three minutes uh, often. Uh, and you don't really get to get to know the, the, the topic, the subject, the person. Um, my shows go for upwards of an hour, 47 minutes. Uh, podcasts are typically long form kind of interviews. Am I, am I, again, old thinking that people want to listen that long? Because clearly TV has gone the opposite direction with really, really short. I think there's a time and place for both kinds of interviews and content, short and long form. But I think you are correct in thinking that long form content is still very desirable. We see that there are podcasts that are five hours long and just tell a story about a moment in history. It's called Hardcore History, what I'm referring to, if anybody listens. Um, and and the, it is just captivating audiences and really incredible because if you really care about something and really interested, it'll keep you hooked. So I like to say, as long as the content is good, give the content what it deserves. Don't stretch that long interview to be even longer just to fill the time. But um, people will sit through for it and want to stay tuned because they like people like learning. That's why they say they listen to podcasts and also talk radio. They want to be entertained and they want to learn something. And so how can we best do that? And if you're learning something as you're listening to a long form interview as you go, then great. People will stick with it. What's your story? How did you get into this? You mentioned that you were a program director on an AM radio, but how did that uh, influence your podcast uh, intelligence and knowledge? Yeah, well, I was... I took journalism at Toronto Metropolitan University, formerly Ryerson, and uh, with a specialization in radio. And my first job was at News Talk 1010 CFRB. And while I was there, I was a producer. I worked as a reporter, a news anchor. Um, but on the side, I was making podcasts. And so this was, I, I, I first started at 1010 in 2010. So it was a while back. And I was making podcasts, but they weren't, um, as mainstream at that time, of course, if you might think back, you know, the first podcast we attribute it to 2004. Um, so this was all still that same early era. It hadn't really taken off yet. So I was experimenting um, and passionate about learning, but really just learning to love audio at that time. Um, so I had a career in radio where then I worked, I worked in North Bay briefly. I went to work at the Moose, um, alongside an incredible host, Mike Monahan as a morning show co-host, um, in FM radio. I came back to Toronto, spent more time at 1010. I did sports reporting there as well. Um, and all the while I was making podcasts. And so I was building this portfolio, experimenting, learning, like I said, and then, um, my career then, I, I stepped away and I worked in more formal communications marketing roles at an agency and, and at a nonprofit. And that's where this intersection of what my company is now really came to be, which was great audio storytelling, but also achieving business objectives through some of these more mark, more traditional professional marketing channels and uh, thought leadership building. And so... In 2020, I launched my business, Lead Podcasting. So we're a full-service production agency that creates shows for enterprise organizations. And so these are branded podcasts, and there is a chapter on this in the book. Um, and we also create internal podcasts. So podcasts for people who are trying to keep them private, but engage like an employee base or an association membership. Um, and so really in 2020 was when I, you know, it's always hard to, to leave what you know and start your own business. And so 2020 is when I finally took the plunge and was doing podcasting full time, um, but I always had a heart for radio. So I did step away to be that pro to take that program director role um, for two years in 2022 and 2023 while running the business, um, but now full time back into podcasting. So I've always danced between the two, you know, but they, they do go hand in hand. And that's why I have a love for both. Tell us uh, what the book is called and where one can get it. Let's Talk Podcasting, The Essential Guide to Doing It Right, second edition. And you can find out more at letstalkpodcasting.com. Let's Talk Podcasting and, uh, and, and communications and what's going on uh, with communications today uh, with Amanda Caputo. In just two minutes, we're going to take a break and be back with Amanda talking about podcasting. Stay with us, everyone. Back in two. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour. Our guest tonight is Amanda Caputo, who has written a book about uh, podcasting and uh, just published the second edition. She's got a long history of experience in uh, in radio and in communications. Um, the book is about 
how to do it right. Is that correct? That's it. It's uh, behind the scenes on some shows that I've made. I have like equipment recommendations, tactics, approaches. I also provide a history of the medium so we can all level set right before we get into it. Okay, so give us some, some suggestions. How do you do it right? Well... There's a whole book on it, but here are some highlights. There is a lot that goes into it. I think right now, one of the biggest things I hear is that people are overwhelmed. And if you start Googling it, there is a lot of information out there. A lot of it can be baloney, to be honest. Someone who's like never made a podcast, who's trying to write an article about it just to like get SEO ranking. Um, sometimes it's people who are not in Canada. And to be honest, the Canadian landscape is quite different um, compared to, let's say, Australia. A lot of similarities, but also differences. So um, my book is nice because it really puts the Canadian lens, but then talks about it in contrast to the rest of the international landscape. And so one of the tips that I like to tell everybody right out of the gate and is commonly missed is that you need to focus on your strategic show development. And when I say show development, this is stuff that has to happen before you hit that record button, before you start lining up guests. And that's where people love to just like jump to. Um, so who is your audience? Who are you trying to speak to? What is the title of a podcast that can really resonate with them and be easy for them to search and find? How are you going to open up each episode? What are the important things that you need to say before you get into the topic of the of the episode, right? So like stopping and thinking about these foundational elements um, is going to help have the rest of things fall into place. And so even when you're trying to source equipment, there is not just one best microphone. There's lots of great microphones that do different things depending on how you're going to record. How many people are going to be on each episode? You might want a different microphone set up, right? So it's a ripple effect um, in in following that initial show development that is that is so important that then a lot of other advice comes from. You got to know what you want to do. You gotta yeah, know you got to be authentic, and you got to have a you got to have a message. That's it, and and authenticity. You you nailed it right there. Authenticity is a big one because. That is why people love podcasting. They feel like they know the podcast host. It's a very intimate medium. And so being able to be true to yourself and not try to train yourself in some different voice, that's another interesting thing. Some people will think they have to do, well, I'm going to practice my podcast voice and talk like this. And it's like, well, if that's not how you normally talk, don't talk like that. <laughs> and so um, really encouraging people to to be themselves. Okay. Um, and how do you get... Traffic. How do you get detention? How do you get marketed? Yeah. So there is an entire chapter on promotion and marketing. Lots of different tactics here. Again, I'll give some highlights. Um, first off, people don't leverage their own network. It's like they skip this step, but it's one of the most important ones. People find out about podcasts from other people. From Podcast discoverability right now is actually very tough. Think about Google. When you Google, you get a page of results in text, video, images, no audio. It's not, it's not happened yet. Um, apparently it's coming, but you have to take different approaches when trying to position your show, just because the technology not has not necessarily caught up to how people are using the medium. So, and, and I'm talking about audio podcasts right now. Um, so I say, leverage your network, tell everyone, you know, about it, create social media assets for them to post. If you have a guest on your show, this is another missed opportunity. So many people don't um, take the time to leverage is prepare social posts for your guests to promote on their channels and activate their audiences. This, what we call peer to peer um, promotion is really, really important. And so even if that's all that you do, and that's an easy one, and that doesn't cost any money, it's a, it's a bit of time and intentionality, but um, you'll be able to leverage that word of mouth, so to say, but also through social channels and through um, people's networks where that's where they really trust. That's going to be a high, one of your highest marketing conversion rates um, when it comes to clicks. So we've uh, figured out why we want to have a podcast. We're out there marketing. Um, what do you need to do before you get your guest on the show? So when you're looking at getting guests on, you want to be able to present your show in a way that it will be enticing and answer questions up front about what it's like to be on the show. And so what I recommend is that people put a sample of what their show is about, the look, the look, tone, feel um, in your email. And this is one of the important 
important reasons to make a trailer. So a trailer for your podcast is like two minutes long and it just sets it up like a movie trailer would set up a movie. And again, this is a step that sometimes is missed. The trailer is really important. Number one, from a technological side to kickstart the feed. I think it's the best way to get that all set up. You have to sync it with everything. And if you're using episode one, you won't know exactly what day it launches. But this initial sync, it happens once and it's best to do with a trailer. So once your trailer is created and out there synced on everything, you now have this piece of audio that you can attach to your emails or include the link um, when doing outreach to guests and saying, here's what my show is all about and really give them something to listen to before they commit. Number one, that shows professionalism. Um, and number two, it's likely going to get them ex more excited about being on the show. And so even if your trailer is created and not launched yet, I tell people to attach it to the email and send that as an example. And that's that's one way to really stand out from from the crowd with with doing outreach. What a brilliant idea! You know, I uh, send out an email to all my guests ahead of time, sort of running through what the what the process is going to be, how long it's going to be, what we're going to talk about, uh, uh, etc. But a lot of them say, "Well, you know, what is it going to look like?" And they want it; they want to actually see it in action. And so you're right, uh, having yeah, a video a in there, or an audio in there, uh, an example would make a lot of sense. There you go. I'm glad. See, you got some takeaways too from this. <laughs> well, I'm sure I'm going to have lots of takeaways. Okay, so so you 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 figured out what you're about. You've marketed it. You got some guests. What do you do? Well, now it depends on what your goals are, right? So, and, and this would be part of the show development phase, where it's like, why am I making a podcast? What do I ultimately want to happen next? I talk about the you the listener journey. We talk about user journeys on the internet and through data. Um, we'll talk about the listener journey. Um, you know what is it that they're going to go click on or engage with right after they finish listening or watching your podcast? And that's something that you can track. That's part of your data, not just listenership numbers, but engagement like this, getting people to take that next step. Um, and so my company naturally does a lot of podcasts for brands. And so when you're looking at this, you're trying to think about what do you want people to do strategically in relation to your business? And so that could be sign up for your company newsletter. That could be go visit the website, uh, follow on social media, right? So all of these different things, that's how you would build that into your call to action at the end of the episode and then track accordingly. And so I think that's a nice way to benchmark yourself and your success against yourself because let's be real, podcast numbers are not available. You can't just go and see how many people have listened to a podcast on Apple. The numbers aren't there. And I kind of like that, actually. You don't judge something before seeing it, right? If you see a video has 8 million views, you already know, oh, i got to watch this. It's gone viral. Um, and if it doesn't have a lot of views, you might not click on it. Whereas podcasts, it's a little more mysterious, but then you can just judge the content for what it is. Uh, but at the same time, it's hard for you then for you to benchmark yourself against other shows. So you see your own listener numbers and you're like, is this good? I don't know. Um, and so that way, if you're able to benchmark yourself against yourself of, all right, I had 10 Instagram followers before I started this and now I have a thousand, well, something's working, right? Um, and it just allows you to track your success a little easier. So how do you distribute? You know, I, um, I'm on the radio, as I mentioned, and uh, I'm told I get 20,000 people on average, but I'm also told that it can vary between 10 and 30. Like it goes up and down fairly dramatically. So the 20,000, is just on average. Uh, and then I uh, take the, uh, the audio content and I put it on a bunch of podcast servers. So I'm not just on Apple and Spotify. I'm on SoundCloud and, uh, and uh, several others that I don't even remember. Speakeasy, I think it's called, et cetera. So there's a, there's a bunch of different podcast servers that, uh, that uh, they put my... Uh, my audio on. And then I'm on video. I'm on YouTube. I'm on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Instagram. Is it good to be that distributed or is it better to be narrow on just one spot so people know where to get you? Oh, it's that's like the million dollar question. I don't think there's any perfect way of doing this. It's amazing that you're distributing it so widely. I do think that's a good thing. One thing to be mindful of is that your content then slightly changes the way people are engaging with it. And so let's say you did want to encourage people to um, engage it. It's really going to differ for them depending on how they are listening to your show, right? So if they're listening on the radio, you would want them to call in or to get in touch with the radio station. But if they're watching it on YouTube, you might want them to comment on the YouTube video. 
or if they're listening on Apple or Spotify, then you've got to see what those platforms offer. Spotify does have a Q&A feature. Apple does not yet. So, right, like even your ask for engagement would be really different depending on how people are listening. And so it does become a little bit more tricky to elicit those kinds of responses. Um, you could always say like, email me, but that's a little bit cumbersome for people like opening up an email, tracking down the email, right? You would ideally like something that's easy in one click. And so, um, so there's pros and cons. I would say going widely, you definitely cast the net wide and large. Um, but then at the same time, you lose out on some of those niche ways of maybe speaking to your audience or encouraging them to do something right after listening um, because you're kind of trying to play to everything. So I would say for people who are just starting out, it's okay if you're not on everything because even just the the manual process of doing that sync is time consuming. I mean, you have some support, but someone who's just starting out might be just doing it on their own. And that's okay. I would say start with one that makes you feel comfortable. If you feel comfortable with YouTube because you're familiar, then great, start there. If the idea of doing video is a little bit overwhelming, you know, there is an extra element of visual and the editing can be a little bit more cumbersome as well, then maybe you just do audio and you stick with just Spotify, right? And so picking one place, really making sure you hone in on it, you get into a good rhythm, then you could always expand later. Is it good to have both the audio and video or is audio what people want more? Well, I'm biased. I'm, a, I'm an audio gal. So I listen to podcasts. I don't watch podcasts, but there's a large group of people that watch podcasts. It's amazing, but they're watching a different type of podcast than what I'm listening to, right? So this chat format lends itself well to a video. And this is what we're seeing take off on social media and become quite popular on YouTube. So that's great if you're doing these kinds of interviews. Um, I create a lot of podcasts that are narrative in format. So one of them that just launched a fifth season is The Forefront from Toronto Metropolitan University. I'm the host of that. But in this kind of format, we are taking the clips of multiple people speaking. I'm stringing it together with narration. It is very journalistic in how it's put together. It feels like a, docu a little documentary, right? Um, and so this narrative format just would not translate to video very easily. You'd have to like animate everything or um, have some B-roll that stops the that fills the gaps in between uh where i'm doing my scripting so um so i would say really thinking about the format of your show how you want people to engage with it and then choosing strategically whether or not a video really aligns with the content and my radio show my radio uh, station wants me to uh, either open or close with my own little uh riff my own little uh, point of view editorial etc um and uh and then frankly you know, some of the shows that I've done where I've actually just spoken without interviewing, uh, chatting with someone, but spoken for like 10 or 15 minutes, have some of the highest views. Um, do people want to hear from the podcast host or do they want to hear from the interviewee? And how do you interview E or how do you balance that? It's I'm not surprised to hear that some of the ones with just you do really well. I think that means that you have a really great audience that's connected to you and that's that's a good thing they care about you they feel like you're their friend they trust you they want to know what you think propping up a guest is also amazing that's how you learn and that's how people might find someone new that they want to learn more about and trust but you've got the trust already and so if you have an established following like that I think that's great to lean into that. People build parasocial relationships with hosts they feel like they're hold friends. It, hold it hold it what was that parasocial? <laughs> Yes, that's the official term where you actually are not you don't know each other in real life, but you but one person on one side feels like they are genuinely friends with you. And so Parasocial, they'll feel like they know it. you. Right. And A so this every day. Fantastic. Yeah. Social. <laughs> there you go. Well, it it came out in in the pandemic. It really became popularized. This notion of parasocial relationships where people were really listening to in isolation, listening to podcasts and podcast hosts became their best friends. Right. And so, um, but this happens all the time, especially with talk radio. This is not new. People feel like they know the host personally. When I was a program director, um, it, working in radio, we actually had a listener who left money to one of the hosts in his will after he passed away. They had never met in real life. He called in all the time. So, you know, the host knew of the name, but would not have thought that 
that was going to be what was coming for her once he passed. And so I think that just goes to show what kind of strength can be made through audio, audio as a medium, right? Like that's pretty powerful. That's very powerful. Unbelievable. Okay. So, so, you know, we've got this authentic uh, uh, mission, this desire that we've, uh, that we've got about what we want to talk about. Um, We've marketed it. Uh, We've uh, figured out how to, to get the guests uh, oriented and, and coming on the show. Um, and we figured out what medium uh, that we're on. Um, how do you keep going? How do you keep getting content? Uh, you know, do you keep on the exact same topic all the time? The exact same theme all the time? Do you run out of things to talk about? How do you, how do you keep it? How do you keep it going? How do you keep continuity? Well, I think you could even speak to this, Brian, because you've had this show going for so long. And right, it's it's about just evolving with your audience, seeing what they respond to, doing more of that, trying to tap into different things as society and the world changes. Um, and also, but setting realistic expectations for yourself at the same time, right? I think there's always going to be things to talk about. That is, I mean, audio storytelling is the backbone of humanity. This is the title of my TEDx talk, by the way. Um, So I could speak a lot about that, like oral histories and legacies, like you're going to be able to talk. Um, But also just knowing what kind of work goes into producing a podcast. And you know, from making this radio show, it, it's not, Um, I mean, I don't like even saying it's easy or it's not easy, but it's, there is a lot of work and intentionality and thought that needs to go in it. And in the beginning, you have to really train yourself on how to be a host. And so um, what I try to say is take off something that take on something that is realistic for you to execute on. Right. So if you think you can, you want to do a million episodes, that's great. Why don't we start with 10 and we're going to call this season one and you're going to commit to doing these 10 and you're going to put it out there and you'll take a pause and see how they do see which one performs the best and let that inform how you continue with the show. And so I think sometimes people just always imagine it's once a week forever indefinitely. And that's what can be overwhelming. So taking off, you know, taking a smaller bite off to chew and, um, and then just letting the data speak for itself to help inform how you approach topics and guests moving forward. TED Talks think that 18 minutes is the perfect length. Do you have do you have a suggestion of a perfect length for a podcast? I don't believe in this. I feel like this is a myth <laughs> because I, you know, a TEDx talk is 18 minutes. Um, there is definitely something to that that works for them. What they've well, that's what they've built. Great, but um, you know, if the content is really really good, people stick around. They will stay. Also, if the content's not great, don't try to stretch it. Some podcasts are like three minutes long each episode. And it's meant to be listened to as soon as you wake up in the morning. Great. Like that can work well, too. We've seen success amongst a wide range of different podcast lengths. So I would say don't get hung up on the time. Get hung up on what story you're trying to sell and how long that'll take. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back in just two minutes with Amanda and talk a little bit more about this oral history that she uh, has uh, has uh, studied and uh, and spoken about uh, and put podcasting in perspective. Stay with us, everyone. Back in two minutes. Mm-hmm. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour. We're chatting tonight with Amanda Capito, who has written a book about podcasting, and she knows what she's talking about. She's uh, got quite a long history in podcasting, uh, both from a from a personal standpoint as well as advising other people and as as well as advising corporations. Amanda, what's the what's the name of the book? It's the second edition. It's out in November. I understand. That's correct. It comes out November 14. It's Let's Talk Podcasting, uh, the essential guide to doing it right. And you could go to letstalkpodcasting.com for all the information. Fantastic. You said that you actually do a talk about the history of of oral communication. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Put us put 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 podcasting in perspective if you could. Yes. I think it's important to know where you came from. And so Last year, I did it, my first TEDx talk, which was a big goal of mine. Um, and there's not a lot of TEDx talks on audio storytelling. And so I was excited to be able to add to the to the database speaking about this topic. And so um, this, my TEDx talk really covers, I, 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 of course, we know that oral histories date really far back to, you know, our earliest ancestors, plus um, in the indigenous communities who have passed along oral traditions through storytelling. Um, But um, so that's like the backbone, right? We know that that has always been um, something that has been an underpinning to many cultures um, and evolutionary means. But what I started to focus on is just like, what is audio storytelling? So first off, you 
I argue you could tell a story even without words, right? And with just sounds. Um, and so there is studies that have been done um, about how many human emotions can be communicated without words. And so if I was to make it sound like, Ugh, you could probably get that I was feeling grossed out or disgusted. Um, or if I was like, ha, huh, you could probably get that I'm relieved or relaxing. And so there are different sounds that can tell a story in and of themselves. And this is how I argue that babies who can't even speak can tell audio stories from day one. So um, this is where this is where I began. I, I, I kind of follow the, the life journey of it. Um, when we look at then radio, of course, we saw that radio was really important, especially in the golden age of radio, where people would come home and gather around the radio station and just sit and listen. This was their entertainment, but also it was a really important way of communicating information about World War II. Um, and sure, there was propaganda, but it's all storytelling, right? And so I think there was a lot of influential pieces that came through in that era. Um, and then we look, and then we, then we said video is going to kill the radio star, and it didn't. Um, Brian, you're still a radio star. You're still going. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it's like it will stand the test of time. Um, it continues to evolve, sure, but people love audio. So when you look at how we communicate right now, um, we definitely see that people are texting more than calling, perhaps, but through our messaging, messaging has now evolved to include voice notes, which now WhatsApp says there are billions of people who voice note every single day using that chat platform. We see voice notes rolled out on LinkedIn, Facebook Messenger. So we know that people still like that voice element. Maybe it's not now being in real time. It's this on demand. You get to hear my, my voice whenever you like because I've left you a voice message within our chat. And so... That's really exciting. Um, I, I, If you look ahead briefly to the future, we're going to see audio continuing to evolve. We look at VR and being immersed in like a 360 simulation. Well, think about a 360 audio experience. Audio is a 360 experience in real life. You can hear things from behind you, far away that you can't see from above you. And so... Right now, we have a very two-dimensional listening experience in most cases. It's just like through earbuds or earphones, headphones that are like one on each side. Um, but there are technologies that are trying to experiment with what they call spatial audio or 360 audio, where you're having that immersive audio experience. And so some Apple earbuds can now accommodate that. But creators are still experimenting with how to make that 360 audio. So like that's going to be something that comes and becomes more prevalent, especially in a car. Think about a car. It's a perfect area for a 360 audio story to be shared because you already have kind of that surround sound set up. So um, that is a, is a part of a look ahead. But the oral history legacy piece, what and, and this was kind of the grand finale of my TEDx talk, which was about just like stories of your life. And how there might be some stories that you tell about yourself that you actually don't remember, but you know, because your parents told it to you and this was something you did as a kid. Or it's a story about how your grandparents first met and it's like really sweet and you hold that dear. But that was not something you lived through or saw a video of. That was something that was just orally passed down to you. And so podcasting allows for people to capture oral histories, their own story, so that it can live on beyond generations, create co cross-cultural connections, and um, have stories that deserve to live forever um, be memorialized. And I think that's really powerful and special. I've done, I think, three eulogies this year. Wow. Um, and uh, it's been very special. Uh, you know, not only reflecting in the eulogy my own recollections, uh, but then going out in the process of uh, of interviewing slash chatting with uh, some of my relatives and other people to get a sense of what other people's recollections are, and then putting it into uh, into a speech. Uh, and then I've been recording them and uh, and actually including them as part of my uh, my podcast, my radio shows. I found that incredibly beautiful. The opportunity so nice. to actually record uh, a story about a loved one. Um, and, you know, people have been doing eulogies for a millennial, uh, uh, undoubtedly. But for me to actually do that, um, research it, interview people about it, record it, and then put it on 
on something that will live hopefully for a while, I think is very special. And I'd encourage other people to really think about that with, uh, with, with their, with their loved ones, with their, their eulogies, et cetera. I think that is really special. And uh, I'm sorry to hear how much loss you've had this year, but I'm so glad that the people that you've had close to you have had you to be able to do that and honor them in that way. And I think sometimes grief works in weird ways and not everyone can muster up even the energy to like execute on something like that. So kudos to you for doing it. And um, I think you've inadvertently set me up to to share also. I don't even know if you know this about me, but um, my company created an app called remember this podcast.com it's free and it's meant to prompt people to tell stories about their life or use it with someone in their final days to capture their oral histories and legacies that they want to live on and so this takes out all the editing for you it just with a click of the button you can use it on a tablet a computer a phone nothing to download just go to remember this podcast.com it prompts you with questions about your life and then you answer them and then you click it and it mixes it down with music and narration. And then you can just keep it for yourself as that as that thing to remember and part of your family history. Um, or you can submit it to the podcast. So we have a podcast called Remember This and it just shares oral stories and histories of people. And we've gotten submissions from all over the world. It's quite incredible. We won a Canadian podcast award last year for it. And um, it's becoming just this really nice memoriam. Fantastic. I didn't know about that. Uh, remind us, how, how do you get to it? It's rememberthispodcast.com. Wonderful. Excellent idea. I got one last question to ask you. I, I've been getting a plethora of invitations to Substack. Um, uh, <laughs> is this something new? And, and it's the opposite of what we've been talking about because it's written, right? What, what's this all about? Yeah, Substack is a newsletter that is subscription based and usually people can pay for either they can you can have a free version, but also you can have a pay, paid version uh, for your audiences. But Substack does indeed have its own podcast player within it so that you can launch your podcast in connection to your newsletter or maybe let people pay more to get the podcast. So this is an interesting model. I personally do not use Substack, but I've known many people who have had success with using it. One of the most Can uh, popular Canadian podcast newsletters runs through Substack. It's called Pod the North. So if you're looking to get information about the Canadian podcast landscape, I highly recommend that. Um, so it's really interesting to see some of these right technology evolving and trying to meet people where they're at. I don't know. I don't know if Substack will be here for the long run, but so far it seems to be pretty successful. Seems like there's a whole bunch of people that want to be editorial writers or columnists. And yes. <laughs> they're using Substack as the way to do that. That's it. Exactly. <laughs> um, where do you think this is all going to go? Uh, you know, we've had this sort of fragmentation of uh, of media um, with, uh, you know, started, you know, with whatever that show was that talked about, you know, there were three people that you would listen to every night and, and you trusted them to now there's echo chambers and, uh, and a plethora of different, uh, communication medias, whether it's AM, FM, uh, regular TV, cable TV, uh, and everything that's, uh, you know, podcast related and video related and Substack related. And, and, you know, it, it seems like no one's listening to one thing anymore. There's not, you know, one place to get facts and news anymore. There's, and, and, you know, lots of people have commented, particularly during this American election, about how we're all living in these echo chambers and only getting information from the people and the sources that we like and we know. Where's this all going? Yeah, it's such a big question and no one knows for certain. I think there's definitely you know, advantages and disadvantages to having this amount of content available. Um, it's great because then you can get things from lots of different sources and be able to cross reference and check things. Unlike if you were just listening to your one six o'clock newscast and if they got it wrong, you, you, <laughs> that was it. Um, so, but at the same time, it's so easy to publish now. And the reality is, and as someone whose background is in journalism, I'm very well aware that a lot of the information is incorrect. And the proper due diligence that maybe newsrooms were doing in the past is just simply not happening with a lot of these things that are getting published. Um, we actually did an episode of The Forefront, uh, the podcast I was mentioning previously, about the death of local journalism, because that too, right? A lot of our, our news sources have become national now, and there's syndication, and we're trying to um, do one show that can go everywhere. But like that local journalism was so important. That's where you found out what was happening in your own hometown. Um, and a lot of the major media outlets have been getting rid of those. And it's sad and scary, and it is impacting the way people are consuming news. Um, 
you asked me, where do I think it all is all? Go so I do recommend listening to that episode if you want to dive deeper into um, the local the local journalism angle of it. Um, but if you ask me for my prediction for where it's all going to go, I do think that there's going to be a, a tipping point in Canada. And also we have to keep in mind, the Canadian landscape is very different than what's happening internationally, right? Like in the UK, radio is still thriving. Like it's a BBC radio is, is still what radio, I would say, quote unquote, used to be here in Canada. It's simply not that anymore. Um, and we've seen a lot of radio stations really struggle and have to make a lot of layoffs and, um, it's just that's not really the same case in the UK. But anyway, if you look at the Canadian landscape, I do think we're going to hit a, a tipping point with regard to the traditional media. And we are going to see some different news organizations pop up. And it's not going to be from they're going to be like startups that got venture capitalist funding. And they're going to try they're going to be the ones who really um, try to tackle how to share, you know, news, capital N news. And it won't just be from the media, the big media brands that we're familiar with, especially in Canada. Um, but I do think that with um, with augmented reality, with AI, we are going to have the capacity to consume more and more because we will be getting synthesized, um, you know, versions of our email and books. We are going to be able to have a screen projected as an AR lens uh, through an AR lens while we're doing dishes so that you could watch something wherever you are in your house. You don't need a million TVs, right? So we are actually going to, our capacity to consume content will increase. We will be consuming it differently. Um, and hopefully from, again, a journalistic perspective that the, um, right, the, the good, the well-researched, well-thought content is ultimately what will win. And I do think that with time, um, People, humanity will will be able to see what that is. And I do have faith that that will happen. You know, it's amazing. I uh, I had this experience the other night where uh, I was with a couple of people and we were sitting around and 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 it was after dinner and, and we wanted to watch what was going on with uh, one of the, well, actually two presidential candidate speeches in the United States. We were watching uh, CNN and then we flipped back and forth to Fox to see how they were uh, covering it differently. And then we, we, we looked around the room and another person was watching a live stream of a Taylor Swift uh, concert <laughs> uh, on, on the internet. And another person was uh, reading the newspaper. And so, you know, we're getting this information from so many different places at the exact same time. And sometimes in the exact same room and family setting, it's, it's, it's amazing how this, this fragmentation, this plethora, you know, there was this book uh, called, I think it was called The Long Tail that said that, uh, you know, as as you have this massive amount of increase of information, uh, a whole bunch of very niche areas are going to become available for people and they're going to get worldwide audiences. I'm not sure if that's true. I think a lot of us are still, you know, watching just the the the, the big stars and the, and the big uh, musicians, et cetera. <clears throat> but I, I find it amazing how... Uh, how we fragmented in our in our sources of information. Uh, Amanda, this has been wonderful. I really appreciate it. Remind us all what the name of the book is and where we can get it. It's Let's Talk Podcasting, The Essential Guide to Doing It Right. And you can go to letstalkpodcasting.com for more information. We're going to take a break and I'm going to come back with a couple of my own views on this topic in just two minutes. Amanda, I really appreciate you joining us tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Brian.